morning. And again, welcome to uh, Methodist Tobiki Heart and Bass with the Senator Grand Rounds. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, the mandatory torture with the housekeeping notice, <laughs> notes that I've got a, uh, a mention. We're broadcasting live stream on YouTube. Please use the microphones to ask questions. The recording will be posted this afternoon, available for everyone's viewing. Please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. If you have questions for the speaker remotely, then please text the Debakey 37607, and you can also submit questions via live stream. Upcoming conferences to mention, we got a Robotic Vascular Summit on March 25th to 26th, Heart of a Woman will be on April 27th, and CVD prevention, CVD prevention on May 4th. So again, a warm welcome. Uh, it's really a privilege uh, to introduce our speaker today. Uh, he's from Italy. This will be pretty obvious pretty soon. And I'm going to try and explain some of the uh, places that he comes from using my Scottish-Italian accent, which may make us completely indecipherable. Uh, first of all, big thanks to Dr. Duarte. Our speaker would not be here today because she's the one who alerted us to this potential superstar that was recruitable from, uh, uh, from Italy. So. With all of that said, Dr. Quarty, the very accomplished cardiac surgeon from Italy. Um, he was born in Italy in 1973 and obtained his medical degree at, here I go, University Statale del Milano. How's that? Any good? All right, that was in 1998 and soon started his uh, postgraduate training in a very well-known hospital, the San Rafael Hospital uh, in Milano with Professor Ottavio Alfieri. So he made, did his residency, here we go again, the Ospitale Rioniti di Ancona. Yes. Any good? Yes. All right. In 2003, and joined the staff there in 2004. From 2005 to 2008, he got in-depth training in congenital heart disease, which is really uh, why he's here predominantly, is to rebuild our adult congenital heart program and take over from Tom McGilbrey. In 2019, he became a senior staff member at, here we go, Polyclinico San Orsalo de Bologna? Yes. All right, I'm getting there. One of the biggest congenital programs in, in Italy and completed his training in heart transplantation and ventricular assist devices. So he's got over 20 years of experience in the spectrum of cardiac surgery, but has a special interest in congenital heart disease, which is going to be the focus of his presentation this morning. Uh, congenital, adult congenital heart disease and heart failure. And in 2022, he was awarded a high specialty in adult congenital heart disease at the Polyclinico San Orsolo Hospital and became a me teaching member of the congenital heart disease and a master of congenital heart disease at his alma mater in the Studiorum University de Bologna. So the focus of his topic today is going to be about adult congenital heart disease and he's really made a huge impact, uh, amazing how he's integrated into the department. also want to introduce Dr. Kay because we have multiple new heart surgeons you know, who've joined particularly to help transplant and adult congenital. So Dr. Kay, wave your hand so everybody knows one another. Uh, it'll be his turn to be up in the podium pretty soon. But with that, uh, let me introduce Dr. Quarty. Dr. Quarty, look forward to hearing. <laughs> So good morning. Um, I'm really excited and scared at the same time to be here to, to give this talk. So every one of us is trying to understand where our future is going. And I start doing this since I was first off. Since I was very young. So I started as an ophthalmologist. 25 years ago, and w during an afternoon in the clinic, I was visiting a, a kid with a glass eye, and the patient needed a visit, but I tried to dilate the wrong pupil, the one on the glass eye. So my expectation of ophthalmology went to zero, <laughs> and I decided to, to try with the cardiac surgery. And you see, my level of hope in the future went up and down. So I was deeply involved in robotic cardiac surgery. And then the robotic cardiac surgery was abandoned at San Rafael Hospital. So my level of hope went down. Then I was involved in OPCAB. And the OPCAB was almost abandoned. And then I, start, I started doing congenital heart disease. And my level of hope increased a lot. I was deeply involved in treatment of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is HLHS, but uh, mortality was, and still is, 30%, so my level of hope went down. I was really unlucky for 15 years, probably, 
And since, since 2014, I'm involved in uh, adult congenital heart disease, and I believe that finally I found my future because the future of congenital heart disease in the adults is bright. What is a congenit adult congenital heart disease? To understand the population of congenital heart disease, we have to uh, focus on three words, which is incidence, mortality, and prevalence. And the incidence uh, in 1952 was found to be around three, uh, three newborns every 1,000 live birds. And the incidence changed considerably, and now in 2002, the incidence was found to be eight to 10 newborns every, uh, every 1,000 uh, live birds, which means 1% of newborns has uh, a congenital heart disease, making the congenital heart disease the most common congenital anomaly in newborns. The major uh, contributor is uh, VSD, ventricular septal defect, and then there is ASD, PDA, and so on. And among the most uh, critical uh, congenital heart disease, tetralogy of alloy is the most common. And as you can see, the incidence and the mortality in congenital heart disease is different among countries. And the, the one with the higher GDP uh, have the lowest, the lowest incidence and the one with the lower GDP uh, have the higher mortality. So the incidence is increasing even because we are more capable to diagnose those patients. What about the mortality? The mortality was very high. So 70 years ago, 70 years ago is just a few days ago. So 70 years ago, among 1,000 live birds, uh, with a congenital heart disease, 86 were expected to die at birth, 207 in the first day, 115 in the first week. So you can see that seven, more than 70% of those patients were expected to die in the first 10 years. And what happened afterwards? I don't know if you have ever seen this picture. It is called the Two Frida. The white Frida is suffering for love, and the, and the suffering is evidenced by the, this blood loss. And this Frida is supporting her with, a, with a, her heart. Why I'm projecting this painter? Because a few years later, this crazy genius giant surgeon, whose name is Walton Lilley, starting started a program uh, uh, using the body of the father or the mother of a patient uh, as a pump. So this is the first living cardiopulmonary bypass. It is called cross-circulation. So one of the relatives was supporting the baby during surgery. And he performed 53 VSD closure in that way. And the survival was very high. But by the way, this is one of the one of the uh, only surgery carrying 200% mortality because potentially you could lose the patient and the mother or the father. In 1953, John Gibbons invented the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine, so the heart and lung machine, and starting from 1953, so 71 years ago, all the cardiac surgery developed. And in in the following 10 years, those two giants invented almost everything about cardiac surgery. And many of the techniques we are still using in congenital heart diseases are, have been invented by Michael DeBecke and Denton Cooley. And this is just to remember myself that it happened in Texas. This, uh, I'm sorry for Dr. Lamsdin, tomorrow is Go-Tex Sunday. I will come with my jeans, boots, bolo, and my hat. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> In 1971, Francis Fontaine designed a palliation for the single ventricle. Uh, it is called the Fontaine procedure. And starting from 1971, a vast majority of patients with a single ventricle are allowed to survive in, into adulthood. 
and we are expecting now to have 70,000 people with a single ventricle and having a fontan palliation. So as a result of this uh, prog uh, progression in technology and in surgery, the overall survival of patients increased. And now you can see late, late era, which is the current era, 93% of patients with the congenital heart disease are, are expected to survive up to 15 years of age. And if we stratify these results according to the severity of the congenital heart disease, you can see that in most severe cases, severe two ventricular uh, congenital heart disease, 90% of patients are expected to survive 15 years of age. And among single ventricle patients, 75% are expected to survive 15 years of age. So here you can see which is the survival expected by, by kids, by newborns with a congenital heart disease. And this is 1980, only 40 years ago. Uh, just to, to make you understand which is the improvement in the last 40 years. And this is in specific. You see the improvement uh, in, uh, is uh, evidence also in VSD, in tetralogy of fallow, in transposition of the grid vessels, univentricular heart, you see here, and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. In, uh, they were expected to, to uh, die in a few months, and now they are expected to survive into adulthood. And those patients who survive are expected to die in, in the following decades for different reasons. So newborns are expected to die mainly for congenital heart disease, maybe surgery or during surgery or in the days after surgery, whilst adults are expecting to die more for other reasons, maybe cancer, the yellow is cancer, and this red and white, and white are cardiovascular disease not specifically related to the congenital heart disease, which means especially cardiac arrest, heart failure, and arrhythmias. So we have an increasing incidence, a reducing in mortality, which is a perfect storm to have an increase in prevalence in, in, in ACHD population. And here you see how the mortality changed between 1987 and 2004-2005. In black you see the general population, general population in black, and in yellow the mortality uh, of um, patients with the congenital heart disease. And you can see that in the last 20 years, the survival expectancy for patients with a congenital heart disease is absolutely similar to the general population, which means that we are expecting to see many patients as 60 years old, 70 years old, and even 80 years old. And the change in prevalence, this is in percentages, you can see that patients older than 20 years of age with a congenital heart disease increased by 45% in 27 years. I believe this is unique in, in uh, medicine, not only in, in cardiac surgery, and by 102% uh, in 27 years among those with more uh, older than 50. And furthermore, by, between 2000 and 2010, the prevalence increased by 11% in children and by 50% in adults. And by 2010, the population uh, of congenital heart disease um, is distributed by two-thirds in adults. So the adults are, uh, have a higher prevalence compared to kids so far. So uh, the overall estimated prevalence is three patients uh, over 1,000 people as a congen adult congenital heart disease, which means in the greater Houston areas, 6 million people, 21,000 adult congenital, 3,000 moderate, 600 with a severe uh, congenital anomaly, and which means in Texas we have almost 3,000 uh, severe adult congenital uh, patients. So now it's time to leave the safe harbor. I was told that this 
this boat for sure will never sink, so I'm, I feel safe. And we have to understand where are we going? What are we expecting from, for, from our future? So first of all, the first question is, who has to take care of these patients? And it has been demonstrated by many papers that the best uh, performance are achieved by congenital surgeons. So congenital heart disease in adults is better performed by congenital surgeons. And where is better a pediatric a facility or, or, or an adult facility? And the answer is that probably is better an adult uh, facility. So congenital surgeon by uh, an adult hospital. This is pretty difficult. So here are the number of patients referred to an adult congenital heart disease center. And you see they were increasing by 1.4% in, in the last 20 years. But since the publication of the guideline with the creation of the ACHD program, the referral increased by 7% every year. And you, uh, underneath, you can see the mortality, which was expecting to increase by 2% every year. Since the creation of ACHD programs, uh, the mortality start to decline by 5% every year. So we are in, the, in, the, in a good direction. But building a program, a program is difficult. And I believe that Dr. Lin know, uh, knows how difficult it is. And we need a routine and preventive care, diagnostic cut and imaging, and we have uh, Dr. Lin, uh, basic interventional and EPS ablation, uh, and we have Dr. Dave, uh, which is fantastic, who is fantastic, sorry, surgical repair and transcatheter valve, and multi-organ transplant and fontan revisions. And I, I, I co cooperate with Cindy Martin uh, for the heart failure, with Eddie Suarez for, the, for transplant of heart and lung, uh, with Mark Gabriel for liver and Richard Knight for, for kidneys. And now that we have a crew, we have our boat, what are we expecting to operate? First of all, since I started 20 years ago, I personally observed, and it is also reported in papers, a shift from primary repair to treatment of residual defects. When I started 20 years ago, it was quite usual to do surgery on ASD, unrepaired VSD, unrepaired AV canal, even unrepaired tetology of allo. They almost disappeared. So that now 60% of patients are redo operation and we are doing surgery on sequelae of the first operation. Doing a so high volume of redo patients expose uh, of, of sure to risk. As you see, the in increasing number of stenotomies means increased rate of possible circulatory arrest, increased rate of possible cardiac injury, and increased the rate of possible uh, postoperative and intraoperative transfusions. And you see here the correlation between the number of stenotomies and the mortality and the number of stenotomies with the, the length of the cardiopulmonary bypass and the morbidity in patients. So first of all, in, it is very important to plan the re-entry. And plan the re-entry means for sure have, having a good imaging and we have Valeria Duarte to do this, who is a master in this. And here, th this is a patient with a fontan circulation and with a huge ascending aorta, the aorta was eight centimeter, and uh, re-entering into this chest means as you, oh Jesus.
uh, means you see entering into the aneurysm but no worries we have to plan everything and we have to be aware that there are many possible solutions for re-entering as peripheral cannulation and so on so it is very important to have a good imaging CT or MRI to understand what is behind the sternum because in the congenital heart disease could be the aorta, the pulmonary artery, a coronary artery, the right atrium, the right ventricle, everything could be behind the, behind the sternum. A conduit, for example. And it is very important to have a peripheral vessel Doppler to be sure that in case of damage, we can cannulate and use the femoral vessel as well as the axillary vessels to know if there are residual defects, because one of the major issue is once you enter into the right atrium, for example, or the right ventricle, if there is a residual VSD or a residual ASD, this is a major problem because the air can enter into the chamber and through the VSD or the ASD go on the left side and potentially cause brain damage. Once we plan the surgery, probably we are going to enter into these three groups. We are doing valve surgery 50% of the time. We are, we are doing heart transplant or we are doing some uh, uh, arrhythmia surgery. Valve surgery, I'm expecting to see many patients with an aortic root dilatation because conotruncal anomalies and single ventricle predispose to have an, an ascending aortic aneurysm. The reason is pretty easy. There are many reasons. It's not really easy. But anyway, uh, this is a patient with the tetralogy of Fallot. And so there is a pulmonary stenosis, a VSD, and the restricted flow into the pulmonary artery cause a, 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 um, a shunt from right to left. And so the flow into the aorta is higher than normal. And the aorta is a stimulus to growth. There are also other stimuli to growth as the geometry of the LVOT, the geometry of the LVOT in conotruncal anomalies predispose the aorta to growth. And in those patients, um, once we have an aortic root and, and, and enlarge ascending aorta, we can do two possible uh, surgery. One is the valve sparing and one is the bental, according to the need of the patient, uh, the um, and the function of the aortic valve. This is a patient, uh, I believe it was 20, uh, 22 or 23 years old. In front, there is the pulmonary artery, is a patient with a, with a, a transposition of the, of the grid vessel presenting with ascending aorta aneurysm and um, uh, and aortic regurge, and in order to access the aortic root, we have to remove the pulmonary artery. So imagine in the transposition, the pulmonary artery is in front and the aorta is behind. So it is weird, and I believe is also fascinating. On a beating heart, I, I isolate the maximum the aortic root. Here I remove all the aorta, and this is the left coronary artery and this is the right because the coronary arteries pattern is different in transposition of the great arteries compared to the usual anatomy. And I'm inserting a, a, a composite graft with a, with a mechanical valve. And uh, once the graft is inserted, it's uh, quite easy to reinsert the, the left coronary artery, then the right coronary artery. And once the, the left side is repaired, we have to reconstruct the pulmonary artery on top. This is becoming pretty uh, frequent because I did four cases like this in the last two years. And now I'm reconstructing the pulmonary artery on top. Then we have the chapter of aortic valve. For sure, by cuspid aortic valve is the most common congenital, let's say, congenital uh, anomaly. But for sure, the repair of the by cuspid aortic valve is becoming more popular uh, day by day, year by year. There are also uh, repair of congenital aortic stenosis, quadricuspid aortic valve in truncus arteriosus, 
and aortic valve regurgitation in conotronchal anomalies. This is the new classification of the bicuspid aortic valve. I don't want you to focus on that, but it's going from partial fusion bicuspid aortic valve to a true bicuspid aortic valve, uh, which was called the type zero from Sievers. And the most difficult to be repaired is the very asymmetric, is the new frontier of the aortic valve repair. And this is a patient I operated as 18 years old with an ascending aortic aneurysm, a, an asymmetric bicuspid aortic valve with a regurg. And here you see I placate the conjoint cusp. This is right and none. So the placation of the conjoint cusp in order to, uh, to reduce the prolapse. Okay, you see here the length of the two cusps uh, has to be absolutely identical in, in the bicuspid. The orientation is pretty easy, it's 180 degrees. This is the um, mitra uh, aortic continuity. Here you can see the um, membrane of septum and I, I mark the conductive tissue and I insert stitches underneath the two commissures in order to do an annuloplasty. This is to avoid further dilation of the annulus and you can also choose the annulus, uh, the size of the annulus by the end of the procedure. You can take a measure with an instrument which is called agar and you can choose, I want a 19 millimeter annulus, a 20 millimeters annulus or a 21 according to the geometry. In that case, I choose for that girl which, uh, whose weight is 44 kilos, which means almost 90, 90, 90 libras. I choose nine, uh, 19 millimeter of, of size. I replace the sending aorta to stabilize the result. And here you see the final result from the eco point of view is, is really good. And I'm expecting a long-term durability of this type of repair. And in fact, in the last, in the last years, you see this one is from Svensson. The durability of the repair is comparable to the biological uh, to a biological uh, valve and the, uh, and the repair in bicuspid aortic valve has uh, substantial identical results uh, when compared to tricuspid uh, uh, valve repair. So aortic valve for sure, tricuspid valve is another big chapter. I'm expecting to see many patients with tricuspid regurg and as a matter of fact, in the last month, I, I did three tricuspid repair uh, here, and we are expecting to have two more, just to tell you which is the prevalence of tricuspid regurg. And the tricuspid regurg could be associated to congenital heart disease. I mean, uh, AV canal, uh, right ventricular outflow, tract obstruction, could be tetralogy of fallow, pulmonary stenosis, or something like this, VSD, and even VSD repair. Uh, iatrogenic due to pacemaker implantation, could be due to absent anomaly or uh, pri uh, primary tricuspid valve dysplasia. This technique is the con repair, has been introduced uh, 15 years ago, more or less in 2008, to repair the absent anomaly. I don't want you to focus on the technique. I want you to focus on this because I'm expecting to do, to use the con repair, to re-repair patients who already underwent a repair for Ebsen anomaly. And uh, we have a patient waiting for a con repair who already underwent 20 years ago uh, to a repair of Ebsen anomaly with an, another technique. And I'm also expecting to, to do con repair in patients who underwent tricuspid valve replacement with valve, with native valve preservations. It has already been described. 
This is a patient with a, with a uh, Epstein anomaly. Is a type C, is an adult. And you see here, I'm uh, detaching the leaflet from the muscle because the in, the, in the Epstein anomaly, the leaflet is completely adherent to the muscle of the, of the right ventricle. Here you see this is the leaflet completely detached and outside in the atrium. I'm closing all the fenestrations. Here is a commissure, then I'm going to close this small fenestration, this big fenestration. And once you have, you have your leaflet completely repaired, we can create a cone. Which, is, which means a cylinder of tissue. Here I'm doing a plication of the right ventricle. This is the cylinder of tissue. I'm closing the cylinder on 360 degrees. Here you see. And once I have tissue all around, I can reinsert the valve on the annulus and create a perfect competent valve. And this type of repair is absolutely reliable, reproducible, and the result is almost guaranteed. I never had a single issue with this type of technique. This is the final result. It's, it seems a, a different patient. And the results are, uh, are very good. As you can see, the red, red line is the one referred to adults. And the survival and the freedom from the operation, sorry, the freedom from the operation is expected to be 99% uh, after eight years. It's a very stable, it's a very stable repair. As a matter of fact, I'm using this technique also to repair other type of valve. When a valve is a dysplastic, is a dysplastic valve is, and is very complex, the cone technique is so reliable that could be adapted to any type of tricuspid valve. This is a patient who had a, a double orifice a tricuspid valve. Both orifices were severely regurgitant. You see the, the gap in the middle and I, I turned the two orifice into a single orifice, and then I did a cone on the single orifice. And this is the final result. Aortic valve, tricuspid valve, for sure pulmonic valve. I'm not going to speak about pulmonic valve, which is pretty common, I mean, since uh, at least 30 years. I'm going to speak about endocarditis, because endocarditis uh, incidence is two times higher than in general population. And even if, if uh, this type of endocarditis is really disruptive, so many times we can see patients with tricuspid endocarditis or pulmonic valve endocarditis with many abscesses or many vegetation in the, in the pulmonic valve. The mortality is anyhow lower than in the non-congenital population since our patients are younger, usually, and the endocarditis is most often uh, on the right side and less frequent on the left side. Endocarditis represents 2 to 4% admission of AS, uh, to ACHD service, and in these five months, we already had one endocarditis, one that went surgery, after um, was a ROS procedure, after a ROS procedure, and mortality is around 7%, and risk factors are repetitive CAT lab procedure, which is, uh, we use a lot of CAT lab in congenitals, pacemaker leads, implantation, prosthetic material, or syndromes. I mean, many of uh, our conotruncal patients have uh, D-George syndrome, which predispose to endocarditis. This is a patient with a single ventricle. I operated, I did three bental on these patients. This patient had a bental um, and 
had a fungemia with, a, with an endocarditis due to candida. And so I end up doing the third time, I remove the mechanical bental and I, I insert an homograft. And now the patient is, uh, is fine and is under uh, antimicotic agents uh, lifelong. Then there is the chapter of heart failure, which is probably the biggest in, in congenital heart disease, in adult congenital heart disease. Heart failure has a critical impact and is the major cause of death, and the mortality rate is 25% for many causes. There are two main groups leading to heart failure. One is having a systemic right ventricle. So the right ventricle is weakest compared to the left ventricle, and many congenital patients has a system, have a systemic ventricle, the right ventricle. And those patients are going to experience heart failure in three decades to four decades. So there are many patients with a, uh, with a uh, uh, trans uh, correct, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or transposition of the great arteries who underwent atrial switch operation who are coming back. And they are coming back with heart failure and requiring or uh, MCS or transplant. And then there is the, this huge population, as I told you, 70,000 people with a single ventricle physiology who are coming back with heart failure because the single ventricle usually is, is prone to dilate and the AV valve is prone to be regurgitant. So that actually 50% of the congenital patients listed for transplant between 2010 and 2014 have a single ventricle, and they were only 18% five years before. So in five years, they doubled. In five years, this is unique in medicine, I believe. And according to data, these are all, all US data, from 2002 to 2013, 40% of patients requiring heart and lung transplant are congenital patients. And in our experience, I believe the percentage is 50% of patients who underwent heart and lung are congenital patients. And in the last year, 2023, 11% of the transplant were performed on congenital patients. 11% of transplant. 80% of those transplants uh, already underwent a prior cardiac surgery. Um, by the way, they are younger, less overweight. I don't know, maybe in Texas, my, my perspective is a bit different in Texas. Anyway, <laughs> less likely to have diabetes, less likely to be a smoker. And by, uh, on the other flip of the coin, they are more likely to have liver dysfunction. The anatomy is complex, so the, the plan has to be really uh, uh, careful. Uh, we usually uh, plan the surgery well in advance, and we plan the transplant well in advance, because for the first step is reconstruct the anatomy, and the second step is do the transplant. This is the mortality in the waiting list for transplant, uh, and you see the mortality is different according, so all these patients are needing heart transplant, all these patients are in heart failure, but in the waiting list, being a patient with the tetralogy of Arlo or being a patient with the Fontan carry a different risk in the waiting list. But since in 2018, the, the rule for transplant change uh, in the USA, the, the mortality in, in, in the waiting list reduced consistently. And which is the expected survival in those patients? Here you see that the mortality is higher in, in the perioperative period because they are, for sure, they are more complex, but the survival after 10 years is much higher than the survival expected in non-congenital patients. 
So it is worth doing transplant in congenitals because they are going to survive to have a higher percentage of survival compared to non-congenital patients. This is the same curve censored by, by the, the mortality, the, um, the operative mortality. And you see which is the difference between congenitals and non-congenital patients. And since we do uh, many multi-organ transplant in congenitals, mainly heart and liver, this is from the uni, uh, UNOS. Uh, seven, there were 74 heart and, uh, heart and lungs, sorry, and 36 heart and liver, and we performed two heart and liver in 2023. The survival of patients go undergoing multi-organ transplant as an adult congenital is absolutely comparable to the non-congenital. This is, an, uh, this is a guy, 18 years old, with an hypoplastic left heart syndrome. He came because of angina. So first of all, plan the re-entry. And I'm sorry. OK, just to show you. This is the tiny aorta, is eight millimeters, tiny aorta connected to the pulmonary artery, and the pulmonary artery was so big that I decided to re-enter the chest once I was on cardiopulmonary bypass. That's why uh, there is a peripheral vessel cannulation. So femoral artery and femoral vein Cardioplegia into the ascending aorta. Have you ever seen doing the cardioplegia in the recipient heart? Probably not, but the reason is that we started four hours before having the heart, the, the recipient, the, or sorry, the donor heart in the room. So since I was not sure to have really this, the donor heart available, I, I decided to, to save uh, the recipient heart because maybe something is going to happen to the, to the organ procurement and we have to turn down to decline the, the transplant. So I protected the heart of the patient. Then I start removing the fontan conduit, uh, reconstructing the aortic arch, reconstructing the left pulmonary artery. And once the, I was ready and all the reconstruction was finished, uh, I called the procurement and I, I asked them, okay, you can come with the heart, we are ready. So it has to be planned well in advance. So here is the fontan tank down, then uh, we, uh, I, I reconstructed the, the right pulmonary artery and also the left. The heart is still here, well protected. Once, the, don uh, once the, the donor heart was available, I removed the heart. The new heart arrived, and then the transplant is absolutely similar to the one uh, you usually see in non-congenital patients. And of interest, out of line, this patient, I know this patient since he was a child because I did all the, all the surgery before. So I did the shunt, I did the glen, I did the fontan, and I did the transplant. And also this is unique. I mean, when you are a congenital surgeon, usually you know your patients since they were a child. And you follow, you follow your patients along their growth. You know the family, you know the mom, you know the brother, the siblings, everyone in the family. And this, I believe this is absolutely unique. And finally, the chapter of arrhythmias. Chapter of arrhythmia is huge because 
the increase of arrhythmias in ACHD is 112% from 1998 to 2006. Eight years, 112% increase in arrhythmias, all the type of arrhythmia. You can have disorder of the sinus node, um, uh, in Fontan, in atrial switch, AV node and ES bundle in VSD, supraventricular tachycardia in Fontan, atrial switch, EBS, and ventricular tachycardia in Fallot. And I believe there is an enormous potential for imaginative solutions. The, f the, main, the mainstay now is CRRT in all the heart failure patients. Leadless pacemaker is uh, just outside the door. New ablation schemes, everything has to be written on new ablation schemes. This is a really a virgin, a virgin field. And use of ICD. These are potential, for example, just, just to show you, is because this is not standardizable, these are potential uh, uh, ablation schemes in, uh, in patients uh, with the um, transposition of the grit arteries. In, this is in patients with Epstein anomaly. And this is in patients with the Fontan procedure. Everything has to be written now. So enormous potential. I'm going to finish. You wish I finished, but I, I still have two, two slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know who about you know about Ernest Shackleton. And Ernest Shackleton was an explorer. And in 1914, he decided to explore the North Pole. He was just leaving the Southampton Harbor when he was told, oh, there, there is already a guy in the North Pole. I believe it was Scott, probably. And he said, OK, no worry. I'm going to the South Pole. No problem. So he went to the South Pole at the beginning of the war. And he had a boat, and the boat name is Endurance. So from the South Georgia, he went down to the, twe to the Weddell Sea. He tried to, uh, to find a, a place where to leave the boat. But it was plenty of ice, because it was November. It was not super smart. Anyway, it was November. And uh, the boat sinks. And the boat sinks. And using this small boat, all the crew went from this point to the Elephant Island. Then they stayed there, uh, and they were used to fish and trying to survive. But by the time they understood that nobody was going to rescue them, and so he decided to leave the Elephant Island with this small boat and do all this trip from Elephant Island to South Georgia. It's 800 miles in the Atlantic Sea. So I believe it was crazy. But all of the crew, all, all of the members survived. And this is what he wrote before to recruit all the members of his expedition. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return is doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And I believe this perfectly fit with the, with the search for new surgeons in the adult congenital heart disease. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think your boy done good. What do you think? I'm sure the finder's fee check will be in the mail for, for, for recruiting him and, and bring him here. So I'm sure there are lots of questions. Dr. Rumson Danny. Excuse me. First of all, thank you for a fantastic talk and a nice journey through uh, uh, the ACHD as you, as you you see it today. That was really, really a great, uh, great talk. Your presentation skills are fantastic. Uh, we are also very happy to have you on the faculty. I'm sure all of us uh, share this. So uh, again, thank you for that. 
I have a question related to the use of 3D printing um, in, um, in congenital heart disease. My understanding is that it is being used more and more now to help you understand and plan, um, plan these complex procedures. Um, what is your opinion on it and are you using it over here? Okay, um, I was used to use a lot of 3D printing since now is uh, uh, easily available and I was used to use 3D printing mainly in kids, not in adults. Uh, just to plan surgery in main complex disease as could be double outlet right ventricle for example with a remote VSD and so I was used to, to use 3D printing for, for that and in adults mainly to plan um, the PAPVR, uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And we were speaking with Dr. Lin to start some 3D printing even here to plan surgery versus transcatheter uh, correction of those patients. But for sure this is part of the future. Maybe not only 3D printing, but also holograms. Also holograms. Dr. Lin? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Party. This is an amazing, amazing talk and an amazing reflection on the history and the evolution of adult congenital heart disease and adult congenital surgery. Um, one thing you said really gave me a lot of angina, which is the idea of 70,000 single ventricles. And then, you know, from our pediatric training, you know, we know that, that that's going to get larger and larger as they improve interstage mortality with each of these patients having gone through at least three cardiac surgeries in childhood. Um, just a few years ago, before Dr. Duarte arrived here, the idea of actually operating on a Fontan, a single ventricle patient, was terrifying to me. Now, this is what we're going to be seeing almost weekly. What are your thoughts about how we're going to handle these patients, especially because at the end of the day, after the fourth decade of life, fifth decade of life, these patients are all going to develop protein losing enteropathy, liver failure and cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, incisional atrial arrhythmias, heart failure, valve dysfunction, and ultimately require transplant. There is obviously no way that the world can handle that many transplants in such complex patients. Yes. How do we go forward so, from here? So for sure, the treatment of the single ventricle failure is, uh, is the most challenging uh, transplant ever. I mean, <clears throat> those patients have a multi-organ failure, which means usually they have weak lungs, protein-losing enteropathy, which predispose to loss of proteins, which means also immunoglobulin, and they are more prone to infections. Usually the, the kidney function is overestimated and many of those patients are going to lose kidney after transplant. At least it happened to me in many of my patients after, after transplant. And a possible solution, uh, because I have not the, right, the, the perfect answer because it is still unknown, a possible solution is to use the VAD as um, as a way to bring a patient from a multi-organ disease back to a single organ di disease, which means you can use MCS, uh, heart mate, and, and bring back the patient to a single ventricle so that you can restore liver function, uh, kidney function, and, and bowel function, and then you can replace just the heart. This is a possible, this is a possible path for the future. Andrea, wonderful, masterful talk. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can you give us a, an idea of the landscape of how many ACHD programs there are around the country, in Texas, in Houston, and what are the kind of volumes that uh, programs are seeing? And yes, maybe if you... Uh, Huey could also... I can be more precise. I can show you. Uh, because I, I, had a, I had a picture of that. Uh, we are lacking. We are lacking a lot of ACHD program. We are lacking a lot of ACHD program, and the most critical state are California, Texas, uh, New York, and Florida, for many reasons. And the main reasons is that those states are the the one with the higher number of inhabitants. 
So we are expecting to have, according to the numbers, six to seven centers of ACHD in Texas, and we haven't. And the same is for California. I, if I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Anyway, there, there is a there is a there is a plan of the country, and you see that the the less ser served areas are California, Texas, Florida, and and the state of New, of New York. Dr. Okay. I'm a maestro, I'll call you, and uh, you really brought uh, uh, the Italian art to the, this presentation. It's amazing talk. We call it and European, actually, European style. Question, <laughs> just uh, the mechanical circulatory support. You, you, I think that was my question, but now I just, just the microphone in my hand. I'm going to ask the other thing. The history repeats all the time, you know, like early referrals in like from stage of the mitral diseases mitral valve replacement. We were sending those patients in the last moment to the surgery, poor outcomes. So, I mean, where are we failing to, to that be causing the multi-organ uh, transplantation on these patients? Why we cannot catch them early or transplant them early? Or, you know, like what we can do on that sense? This is a good question. Actually, I, I don't know how to answer because I still do not fully understand the USA uh, organization. Uh, probably the best way is to promote a good transition between children hospital to adult hospital. In Italy, uh, it is different because once you, you are performing congenital surgery, you are following the patient since newborn age to adult age. And here we have different hospitals to do that. And so promoting the transition when the patients are adolescents probably could answer your questions. Dr. Duarte. Thank you. First, Dr. Duarte, thank you so much for taking a leap of faith and moving with your family to help our program. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a question for you for those surgeons that are hopefully considering pursuing a career in ACHD surgery. Uh, we need more like you desperately to answer Dr. Atkins. There are 56 programs accredited in the US, five in Texas. Uh, we, Houston Methodists, are the only hospital, the only ACHD program in the nation that is solely run by an adult hospital. And, and I think that's a model that uh, we will need to develop in the future, and we're very proud to be pioneering it. But for that purpose, we're gonna need more like you. So what, what would you tell to these young surgeons in the making who's co who are considering going into a quest with reward in case of a success like you described? <laughs> that is, uh, is difficult, is difficult because um, I remember when I was 27 or 28 and I, I had itchy hands. I, want to, I wanted to be in the OR all, every day, but if, if you are planning to be available as a full surgeon, full trained surgeon, when you are 30, probably ACHD is not your field. You have to plan to, to build your practice little by little. So first of all, you have to be able to to do all the congenital uh, stuff, and, and then you have to be able to do all the adult surgery, and then you can put all together and do uh, adult congenital. So it's going to be very long. Um, the exposure to surgery is lower than every, every resident would like, to, would like to have. But on the, other, on the other side is, I believe, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I believe is really fascinating something is something different is a new is a new surgery so, so i think before, before we get the last word which is always highly appropriate to dr martin i taught this guy to fish and you know there's a, a saying in our fishing world cindy that uh, and it alludes to what you just said you give a man a fish you feed him for a day you teach a man to fish you feed him for a lifetime and i think that's kind of the expectation is that you, as you build this program that you start reproducing the people who are out there so as always, the last word goes to Dr. Martin. <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> so first of all, Andre, again, I want to just follow up all of us by saying we are so grateful to have you here, not only as a colleague, but as a friend. 
um, and Thank really you. enjoying uh, the amazing uh, things that you add to our program in the future that you're going to help us build. Um, but I think you pointed out a really good thing, and I think um, you know Dr. Dorte and Dr. Lynn has also pointed this. I think it's amongst us and the adult co community to realize that congenital heart disease is, a, is now an adult problem. Um, and I think we have to change that narrative because most people have thought that congenital heart disease is a pediatric problem. That is not true anymore. And as the data, the data that you showed and has highlighted, the average age of a congenital heart patient is now 57 years old. And so I think that you know moving forward to that, and I think the things that you said and bringing through, and the leadership that you're bringing, and Dr. Lynn, and 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 moving this forward is going to help our field tremendously. So not a question, but just an appreciation of what we have. Thank you very much, Cindy. Well, you. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me make one comment, and that is, you, you do have an advanced scout from Texas Children's here checking you out to see whether this program's for real. You're very welcome. We're glad you're here. But let me make Shackleton has become the hot topic. Um, and cardiac surgery circles. And so I actually talked about Shackleton probably two years ago. And I, I, is Neil finishing the case upstairs? Okay, so. Sorry, the cardiologist working. So Shackleton was regarded as the most impressive fit guy, and he kept his people alive by exercising them when they're on the ice. And he lost no people, and he was a national hero. And Neil came up to me afterwards and said, do you know who shared a birthday the same year as Shackleton? I said, no, of course, no idea. And he said, Winston Churchill. They were born in the same year. Shackleton died a year after he got back from this expedition from an acute MI. Churchill lived till he was 91. And then the picture of Churchill is he's overweight, he never exercised in his life, he's always got a cigar and he's drinking whiskey. And Neil said, it's all about your genes. Just remember, it's all about your genes. So thank you, that was a spectacular top, wonderful. <clears throat> Good job. <laughs>